Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, it's always exciting to gather together to worship you and then to hear from you, Lord, as we study your word. And we just pray that we're open to your Spirit's guiding tonight as we finish up the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, Lord, just uh, keep our, our eyes and hearts focused upon you and these lessons that you have for each of us. I pray for every person here, those listening on the radio, the internet, Lord, bless them as your word is opened up. We thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to look at chapter 33 this evening as we continue our study through the word of God. And like I've said tonight, we're going to finish up the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, J.A. Thompson wrote regarding the book of De Deuteronomy these words because, you know, a lot of people don't like going through the book of Deuteronomy. It, you know, why do that? It's just a repeat of everything that they've pretty much been through. But this is what he wrote. Deuteronomy is one of the greatest books of the Old Testament. Its influence on the domestic and personal religion of all ages has not been surpassed by any other book in the Bible. It is quoted over 80 times in the New Testament, and thus it belongs to a small group of four Old Testament books, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah, to which the early Christians made frequent reference. Now, tonight as we open up here in Deuteronomy chapter 33, we're going to see the last public address that Moses gives to the children of Israel before he dies. And he's going to give them a blessing, each of the tribes, and kind of a prophecy, really, of what's going to transpire in these tribes. I guess I can say it's not always a blessing for some of them, but we'll see that as we go through it. But this is the end of the road for Moses, and he's given his goodbyes to the 12 tribes of Israel, the ones he's been with, loved for 40 years. Imagine, you know, cap camping with 2 to 3 million people for 40 years. Hey, that's not easy, is it? And he loved them. Did he have some difficult times over those 40 years? Yeah. And I think we can understand that because... That would be tough. I mean, these the children of Israel were not very easy people to get along with all the time. But remember what Moses wrote in Psalm 90, verse 12. He says, So teach us the number of our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Moses is not numbering his days anymore. He's numbering his hours. His life is coming to end, and he knows it because the Lord already told him. He's going to climb up Mount Nebo and surrender his life into the hands of the God he loves so much. And, you know, <clears throat> we need to be reminded that our days are numbered, and we need to use them to the fullest for the Lord. You know, leaving blessings like Moses was behind for people to learn and grow in their relationship with the Lord. So, with that as our introduction, let's pick up in Deuteronomy chapter 33, beginning in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Remember way back in Genesis chapter 49, we saw Jacob or Israel give his blessings to his children before he died. And now Moses is doing the same. You know, not his children, but the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel or Jacob. Um, and for Moses, again, he was a shepherd for God's people these past 40 years. And he couldn't just walk away from them without blessing them. I think, you know, that was on his heart. And again, not easy, but he did love them. And here's the great thing. We're told Moses, the man of God. I like that. You know, isn't that how you want to be thought of? That's how I want to be thought of. Joe, the man of God. Everything else is nothing compared to that. That's the most important thing. You know, I want my love for God to be so deep that it's reflected in my actions, the things that I say, that people would see me as a man of God. And my prayer is that I would finish the race that God has set before me strong. Just like we're going to see as, as we finish up in the book of 2 Timothy on Sundays. Moses finished the race strong, and I want to finish the race strong as well. And that's what, you know, in fact, this is what Paul said. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Yeah. 
Paul knew that his life was coming to an end. He's in prison. He's in the Mamertine prison there in Rome. That was just a stinking hole. Uh, and you were waiting to be put to death. And that's what Paul is. He's just waiting to be executed for his faith in Christ. But he wanted Timothy to know that he's fought that good fight. He's finished that race that was set before him, and he's kept the faith. And he wanted Timothy to do the same. Verse 2 says, And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. Yes, he loves the people. All the saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Jeshurun. When the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. So before he gives these blessings, he reminds them of God and how he met with them on Mount Sinai and gave them the law. And there were thousands, ten thousands of saints or angels who were with him when he gave the law. We didn't read that in Exodus. We're told that here in Deuteronomy, but we weren't told that in Exodus. And I guess it had to leave an impression on the young Jewish people who were there. Why did God do this? It says he loves the people. Now, it's kind of interesting because when you look at the people, they, weren't, they were stiff-necked, God says of them. They're stiff-necked, rebellious people. But it says God loved them. And he does love them. And we see that over and over, God's love for his people, not because they were so special, but God has chosen them, chosen them to be his people. And through them, the Messiah was, would come and has come. And think about it. The same is true for us. And we have to remember that God's sovereign grace and love are never reasons for pride on the part of sinful people. It's not because oh, I'm such a good person, God's gonna, God has to use me. No, I'm nothing, and God has chosen to use me. He's chosen to use you. And it should keep us humble and really cause us to even want to serve him more, knowing that he uses people like us for his glory. Now, what's interesting here is it says, he was king in Jeshurun, and it's a poetical name for the people of Israel, Jeshurun. It was a term of affection, meaning the dear upright people, the upright ones. Really? I don't know. We've gone through Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Are they really that good of a people? Or really not. Well, why did God say that? Because I think that's how God sees them. Not perfect on a practical level, but positionally, the blood of Christ cleanses us. Well, what about these people? They were looking, many of them, forward to the coming of the Messiah. We look back on the finished work of the Messiah, and the blood of Christ cleanses us. Remember when Jesus was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth? I think that's when he went and spoke to those that were in Abraham's bosom. And I think that that place where the faithful were at after they died is empty now, and they're with the Lord. So as we read on here, here's the blessings. Let Reuben live and not die, nor let his men be few. So Reuben gets the first blessing here. And it speaks of the growth of this tribe, and yet there was never a prophet a judge or king that came from the tribe of Reuben. And that's kind of what Jacob said back in Genesis 49, verses 3 and 4, that they would not excel. And this is one of the two and a half tribes that didn't go into the promised land. They remained on the east side of the Jordan River in the upper northeast section of the Dead Sea region. So, yeah, they grew in numbers, but nothing big from them. Verse 7 And this he said of Judah, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him to his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and may you be a help against 
his enemies. It's interesting, Judah means praise. And Moses prayed that the Lord would hear the voice of Judah, or really that the Lord would hear the praises of Judah. I also think that, especially when you look at what uh, Jacob said in Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12, that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. In these verses in Genesis, it says, Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the necks of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. So Jacob not only speaks of Judah being praised, but also as a lion. Maybe because royalty is associated many times with a lion, the king of the beasts, you might say. But I think there's another picture here that's emerging, that the Messiah is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, in Revelation 5.5. 5. We also see that God's going to become flesh. He's going to dwell among us, not in the New Testament, well, we see it in the New Testament, but we see it way back in the Old Testament. In Micah 5.2, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Almighty God became flesh and dwelt among us, went to the cross of Calvary to pay in full the penalty for our sins. And we praise him. Well, some say, well, how do you know that this is speaking of God becoming flesh, being born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah? Because it says, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. The word everlasting is from beyond the vanishing point. In other words, this child who's going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, specific Bethlehem, he's always existed. He's eternal. And there's only one who's eternal, and that's God. So God became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, here's the thing I find amazing, because it really got the Jewish religious leaders in an uproar during the uh, Roman era. In Genesis 49 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. The scepter and lawgiver is speaking of authority, rulership, one who decrees. And it says it's not going to depart from Israel until Shiloh comes. Well, what's Shiloh? Well, it's the name of a town, obviously, but that's not the idea here. In fact, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, translates this verse like this. Until the things laid up in store come into his possession, or until he comes to whom it belongs. In other words, they understood it as a messianic term. We see it in Ezekiel 21, 27. Overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown. It shall be no longer until he comes, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. We're both speaking of Jesus Christ. Even the Jewish Talmud, which is a collection of old uh, rabbinic writings, um, translates Shiloh as one of the names of the Messiah. So Shiloh is speaking of the Messiah. The problem comes in about 7 A.D., the Roman government took away the right of capital punishment for the Jews. And that's why the Jewish leaders presented Jesus Christ to the Romans, because they wanted him executed, and they couldn't legally do it. And during this time, around 7 AD, the high priest put on sackcloth and ashes because he felt the scepter had departed from Israel, and Shiloh had not come. The word of God was broken. Wow. They were looking at it from their physical eyes, and it looked like a reality. Rome took away the right of capital punishment. Shiloh didn't come. Well, does God's word ever fail? No, 
Absolutely not. You see, 70 miles away to the north in the town of Nazareth, there lived with his mother and stepfather a young boy named Jesus. Shiloh had come before the scepter departed from Judah. Jesus was probably born around 4 BC or so, before the death of Herod the Great. And in Numbers 24, 17, it says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. Again, if Shiloh had not come before the scepter had departed, then the Messiah would never come. That's just the reality. And he's come from the tribe of Judah, and we should praise him for that. Now, it's interesting, as we're going to see as we go through these tribes, the tribe of Simeon is not mentioned here. Why? Well, some feel it was a small tribe and surrounded by the tribe of Judah, thus kind of assimilated into that tribe. That's possible. Um, another possibility is the tribe of Simeon was involved with the sin in Numbers chapter 25 with the incidents of Baal Peor. Uh, Zimri, a prince from the tribe of Simeon, brought a um, woman into his tent, into the heart of a camp, and sinned um, with a priestess of Midian. And so that may be another reason why they kind of just left out of this blessing by Moses. In verse 8, we're going to look at Levi. And of Levi, he said, Let your Thuman and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa, and whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children. For they observed your word and kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. For the tribe of Levi, Moses prayed that their enemies would be defeated and this tribe from which the priests came from, the descendants of Aaron were the priests, they would teach the children of Israel the things of God. Now, again, the priests were descendants of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. The Levites were also involved with the care of the ta tabernacle and later on in the temple. Um, now, this Urim and Thummim, lots of speculation what that was all about. Many feel it was just a stone, the black and white stone, and they were able to discern the will of God. We don't know. That's speculation. But whatever that they were using, it was, again, to discern what God's will was in a certain situation. And the high priest was responsible. Um, these stones were placed in the breastplate of the high priest. Um, so, again, very interesting. Um, now, who was the one tribe that stood against all the others at the golden calf incident? It was the tribe of Levi. And God made them the priest. They stood against their own people. And the other thing that I find interesting, and again, you can look at Genesis 49, verses 5 through 7, the blessing that... Um, uh, Jacob gave, they were going to be divided and scattered. Well, that's exactly what happened to them. We'll see as we get into the book of Joshua that they were not given any land because the Lord was their inheritance. But they were scattered through 48 Levitical cities throughout the land, in the promised land, and then there were some also <clears throat> on the west side of the Jordan River where uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh stayed. So they were spread throughout the land of Israel. And that's so important because that meant everyone was able to hear the things of God. They were able to ask questions and find these things out, which is really important. You don't want to be so far away from Jerusalem that you have no idea 
you know, it takes you uh, a while to get there and it's your short trip and it's not like you had them in your own community like God set up here. Verse 12 of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. The tribe of Benjamin was a very small tribe. They occupied a area of land that was adjacent to Judah's northern border with the city of Jerusalem uh, on the northern border of Judah and the southern border of Benjamin. That's where the sanctuary, that's where the temple was going to be located uh, during the time of Solomon. And Benjamin would be close to the Lord who dwelt there. And I think that's what this verse seems to indicate, close to the heart of the Lord. And even though this was a very small tribe, these guys were fierce warriors. We see it in Judges 5.14 um, and, you know, I guess you don't have to be a big tribe to be fierce warriors. That's just what they were. Look at verse 13. And of Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord is his land, with the precious things of heaven, with the dew and the deep lying beneath, with the precious fruits of the sun, with the precious produce of the months, with the, beast, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of everlasting hills with the precious things of the earth in its fullness, and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. Let the blessings come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. His glory is like a firstborn bull, and his horns are like the horns of the wild ox. Together with them he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. So Moses is blessing the tribe of Joseph, which is broken down into his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they were very blessed. And that's kind of what Joseph, or Jacob, excuse me, talked about in Genesis 49. And sadly, half the tribe of Manasseh stayed on the uh, other side of the Jordan River, on the east side of the Jordan River, in the upper portion of the land. Um, half of it was in the Promised Land, but half of it didn't enter in. That's a tough one. You know, I, I don't understand it. Yes, the land was very fertile where they were, that they occupied, but it was not in the promised land. And they were the first, those two and a half tribes were the first to go into captivity when the enemies came down upon them. They didn't have anyone to help them out like the other nations did. Verse 18, and of Zebulon, he said, Rejoice, Zebulon, in your going out, and Issachar in your tents. They shall call the peoples to the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and of the treasures hidden in the sand. So the tribes of Zebulon and Issachar settled near the Sea of Galilee. And it's interesting, and I'll just throw this out, when it speaks of the treasures hidden in the sand. What is that about? Personally, I think it's speaking of oil. Um, you can check out Zion, oil, and gas. They've looked at what it says here in Deuteronomy, and they applied for license to dig in this area for oil. Uh, they feel there's more oil located in Israel than in all the Arab countries that are out there. They found huge gas deposits. Where there's gas, there's oil. And so we're going to deal a little bit more with this when we get to Asher, because I think that plays another role in here. But again, it's a very good possibility. That's what it's speaking of. Verse 20, And of Gad he said, Blessed is he who enlarges Gad. He dwells as a lion and tears the armor and the crown of his head. He provided the first part for himself because a lawgiver's portion was reserved there. He came with the heads of the people. He administered the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. So Gad, they stayed on the east side of the Jordan River, right between the tribes of Manasseh and Reuben. Uh, and they were powerful warriors, very powerful. And in fact, 1 Chronicles 12, 14, we're told of the mighty men that Gad provided for King David. It says, these were from the sons of Gad, captains of the army. 
the least was over a hundred and the greatest was over a thousand. So again, you know, very fierce warriors. Verse 22, and of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Here's the thing. Dan was not a good tribe. In fact, they brought trouble to the rest of the nation. And I, I think that's what Moses is saying here. I don't think it's complimentary. Uh, I'll show you why. Uh, they brought the nation into idolatry. In Judges 18.30, the tribe of Dan introduced idolatry into Israel. Jeroboam, king of the northern kingdom of Israel, set up one of the idolatrous golden calves in Dan, according to 1 Kings 12, verses 26 through 30. When we were there many years ago, we got to go up there and see where this was located, where this golden calf was placed, up in the tribe of Dan. And in the end, the tribe of Dan became the center of idol worship, as Amos 8.14 tells us. This is a, a troubling tribe. Even Jacob spoke of that in Genesis 49. Now, what is this reference to Bashan? Bashan was an area located in the northern part of Israel, but Dan was more towards the south. So what is that about? Well, hundreds of years after Moses spoke these words, the tribe of Dan migrated to the north in this area of Bashan, according to Judges 18. So we see that played out. Verse 23 of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full of blessing of the Lord, possesses the west and the south. So the tribe of Naphtali had land that was north and west of the Sea of Galilee, and its southern border was the Sea of Galilee, and it's a blessing. I don't know, the Sea of Galilee is not very big, but man, it's beautiful. And to be on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, it's kind of cool because Jesus was on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. It's just kind of a fun place to go visit, and they have some great fish on the Sea of Galilee as well. Um, we also need to remember Jesus did most of his earthly ministry in this area. And so it was full of blessing of the Lord because the Lord was actually there teaching in that area. And he spoke godly words, words of beauty. Yeah, I think so. Well, verse 24 is Asher. And of Asher, he said, Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze as your days, so shall your strength be. So the tribe of Asher had land allotted to them in the northern part of Israel along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. To the east of Asher were the tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali, which again I find interesting when you look at what these verses are saying. And we got this phrase, let him dip his foot in oil. Now for the most part, most commentators say, it's speaking of olives, of course. And you produce what? olive oil from olives. And so that's what this is all about. We all saw the Lucy show, right? Where she's, that was grapes, but same kind of idea, you know? In fact, Warren Worsby put it like this. To use precious olive oil on your feet would be a mark of wealth. And Asher's territory was blessed with many olive groves. The word translated shoes is also translated bolts, referring to strong security at the city gates. So the tribe would enjoy fertility, brotherly love, prosperity, and security, and the Lord would give them daily strength to accomplish their work. What more could they want? And it could be, it could be speaking of the olive oil, but I also think that it could be speaking of oil. This is a report, it's a few years back, 2018, uh, about oil in Israel. And this report says Moses' blessing to the tribe of Asher regarding oil in the allotment of land is continuing to come to fruition. As Zion Oil and Gas announced Tuesday that it has definitely found oil and is nearing testing the well for commerciality. We also recognize that the goal of this well was to find oil. And we could say with absolute confidence that we were successful in attaining that goal, said Zion's president and chief operations officer, Dustin Gwynn. 
The next crucial step is being able to effectively test and establish the well's commerciality. I'm excited about this phase as it will be a crucial and historic moment for Zion and its shareholders. Last week, the operators of the Tamar and Leviathan natural gas fields have signed decade-long con long contracts to sell $15 billion worth of natural gas to Egypt. With the news, Israel will now be providing both Egypt and Jordan with natural gas. So it's very interesting that this is a big possibility, that this oil is speaking of um, crude oil and not olive oil. Time will will tell, but again, they're very excited. And like I said, they firmly believe there is more oil in under the ground in Israel than all the Arab countries around them. Verse 26, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to help you and in his excellency on the clouds. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. Then Israel shall dwell in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone. In a land of grain and new wine, his heaven shall also drop dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tread down their high places." So Moses is just speaking about how God poured out his blessings upon the children of Israel. There's no one like the God of Israel. He comes to their side in times of trouble. He defeats their enemies. He makes their land bountiful. There are people that have been saved by the Lord, by Yahweh. And, you know, again, you know, with this whole war in the Middle East that's going on, and people don't like to call it a war, but it is, when Iran launched all those missiles and those drones, like 90-some percent of those were knocked down by the defense of Israel. Oh, man, they have a really good defense system. Even their own people say there's no way it should have shot down that many. What happened? I think it was the hand of God. You know, even if 20% of those missiles came through, think about the thousands of people that would have been killed. But they weren't. God protects his people. Are, are they living for him right now? No. They're really not. They're, they're apostate, you might say. But God's not done with his people they are going to turn to the Lord. And we see that happen. Yeah, are Jews turning to the Lord today? Sure. But all Israel will be saved, according to what Paul said in Romans. And it happens during the tribulation period, where they turn to their Messiah. Jesus said, you will see me no more till when? Do you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? When they recognize Jesus as their Messiah. In fact, you know, Daniel talks about... Uh, taking away their sins. How are their sins taken away? Paul said that in Romans. How are their sins taken away? By the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Not through the sacrifice of bulls and goats, because that can never take them away. But the blood of Jesus can. Warren Worsby kind of summed up these verses like this. He said, Israel would face many enemies and fight many battles as they conquered the promised land. But God would give them a victory. They would dwell in a safe and productive land, separated from the pagan nations, but bearing witness to them about the God of Israel. God would be their helper, their shield, and their sword, so they had nothing to fear. Israel's greatest danger wasn't the armies around them so much as the appetites within them. Their hearts needed to be weaned away from their love for idols and the sins associated with idol worship. In the end, the Jews accepted and worshipped the gods of the nations they defeated, and this led to the spiritual and moral decay of the nation. Instead of treading on the high places, Israel sank lower and lower into the pits of sin until God had to send them into captivity. Yeah, God warned them, just as he's warned us. I mean, look at our nation. Our, our nation's in a state of chaos. You know, we have a younger generation. I'm not talking about every single young adult, but we have a younger generation that is like a lemming. 
and they just follow where they are being led and they don't even know why. You know, look at some of these interviews with these kids that are protesting now, you know, pro-Palestine, destroy Israel. What are you here for? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You're protesting something. You, you should know what you're here for. We're for Palestine. Do you know what? Are you against Hamas? Well, no, they're Palestinians. Do you know what they did? Burned children, babies, raped the women. There's still over a hundred some hostages being held. And you're for that? You're okay with that? Where's the outrage in the world? Where's the United Nations? Remember, they're the United Nations. Where are they saying, Hamas, you release those captives right now. You send them home. Have you ever heard that from them? No, because they're not a United Nations. We know what this world's going to be like, and this shouldn't surprise us. They are going to come against the Jewish people. They will come against Israel. And we're seeing a taste of that right now. Who would have thought in our country we would see what we're seeing? Where Jewish students would not be able to go to their classes or go to the library. And I'll give you a little, a little side note. Go look at some of the pictures in Germany where you see soldiers standing, guarding the schools and not letting the Jews come in. We're repeating history, guys. But God is with his people. Never forget that. And here's the thing for us. If God is for us, who could be against us? That's a rhetorical question. I mean, he's almighty God. So who could really be against us? Does that mean we're not going to face difficult times? Of course not. But God is with us. And there is no God like our God. And I'm so thankful for that. You know, there's a, an old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. You know, it goes like this. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What, I, what have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Yeah. We're safe and secure. Do you think that anyone can do anything to us apart from God allowing it? That's an interesting statement. But they can't. God is with us and we're in his care. Now, as we move into chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, it's kind of an appendix for the book. Uh, many feel that Joshua added these notes because it's going to speak of the death of Moses. But look at what we have here in verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan all Naphtali in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the south in the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. So the whole range of mountains east of the Jordan River was called Abiram, and one of the summits of the mountain was Pis Pisgah, the other was Nebo, probably the higher of the peaks, 2,631 feet, not huge, but... That's where Moses would climb to die. Now, some say, and I can't verify this, but you could see 120 miles north to Mount Hermon all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. It seems excessive. I just know that God gave Moses the ability to see all the land that the children of Israel would occupy. He didn't let him to allow him to go into the promised land because of how he represented the Lord. But here's the thing about our God. He is so gracious and merciful. God allowed Moses to see this land. And it's interesting because when we get to the New Testament, 
Moses does get to get in. Kind of a backdoor approach, you might say. But let me just share with you from Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. We're told, And he said to them, Surely I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Sounds like a television commercial for laundry soap, right? And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say. Again, if you don't know what to say, better not to say anything, right? Uh, it says they were greatly afraid, and a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Who was with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses, he got to go into the land. Man, is our God gracious. Unbelievable. Personally, I believe Moses is one of the two witnesses that we see during the tribulation period. We see it in Revelation 11, verses 3 through 14, where John tells us, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, or three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. They, these have power to shut heaven so that, there, that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they sent it to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In that same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, behold, the third woe is coming." First of all, one of those witnesses, of course, is Elijah. How do I know that? Well, because Malachi tells us that. Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dead, dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. He wasn't Elijah. He was a type. And he was preparing the people for the coming of the Messiah. Elijah is going to come and prepare the people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Why do I think Moses is the other one? Well, Moses represented what? The law. Who did Elijah represent? The prophets. So you have the law and the prophets. Some of the you know, we see them with, on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. When you look at the miracles, some of the miracles are very similar to what happened in Exodus. So I think, you know, Moses will be there. He'll be in the land of Israel. And again, God is very gracious and merciful with Moses as he is with us. Well, verse 4 of Deuteronomy 34. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So here it is, the end of Moses' life. 
Moses hears from the Lord one last time before he dies. And God tells him, look, all I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to come to pass. They are going to enter into the promised land. And it's going to happen very shortly. What God promises, he is more than able to do. You know, we, we look at this world and go, man, it's never going to get better. Well, I read the end of the story. It will. And if you're struggling with that, read the end of the book. It's a great ending. God brings it to pass. Verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. I find it interesting. Moses didn't die because he was old and sick. He didn't have a heart attack or die of old age. His work was done. It was time for him to go home. Moses was the lawgiver. The law can never take you into the promised land. How do we get into the promised land? Yeshua, Joshua. Who leads the children of Israel into the promised land? Joshua does. Moses could take them right to the border. And that's what the law does, right? The law shows us that we're sinners. That's all it could do. The law is just a mirror to show us what we're like. But it can't do anything. I've tried. I've looked in the mirror. Man, can, it, can you help me look better? The mirror can't. The mirror just shows it what it's like, man. It can't do anything for me. So now I know that I'm a sinner because the law showed me I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. So the law brings me to Jesus. That's what Paul talks about in Galatians. It was our tutor, our schoolmaster. It brings us to Jesus, to that saving faith. Also, notice that there's not a lot of fanfare here about Moses. I mean, I don't know. The guy was 40 years camping. I think a little bit more, right? Why? Because he's a servant. He's a servant. We're servants. We don't get the glory. God does. How did they? Moses didn't sustain him those 40 years. God did. And we got to remember that. You know, think about the tombstones that could have been written, though, of Moses. You know, I was, where was I at? I, I can't even remember. Oh, now I remember because it's springtime and it's plant season. And Julie was looking at, she was at a plant store. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to go walk. And there happened to be a cemetery next door. I thought, well, I'm just going to walk through the cemetery. And it, there was like graves from the late 1800s there. It was incredible and all these things. And what's interesting, little side note, is these old graves, the way they had them displayed was it would say father, mother, and then it would have their name underneath it, brother. I thought, wow, that, that's, I don't see that often today, but that was very interesting. But I think about it. Moses, the prince of Egypt, right? That's a great name. But no. Moses, murderer of the Egyptians? Yeah, okay. Shepherd in the wilderness, spokesman for our nation, miracle worker, prophet, lawgiver. I mean, you can go on and on. His title was simple. Moses, the servant of the Lord, the servant of Yahweh. That's it. That's the key. The work was done. Yeah, did they mourn for him? Yeah, that was common. But the work was done. Now Joshua is going to take over. Now, this is something that's strange to me. And God buried the body of Moses, and no one knows where his grave is to this day. Isn't that weird? God buried him. You think, well, okay, maybe because if we knew where the grave was, people would put up a shrine or be a church built there, and people would worship. Yeah, that's very true. Except when we get to Jude... Verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, 
dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. What's going on here? Why was Michael the archangel contending with the devil over the body of Moses? I don't know. Maybe because he's trying to prevent them from what's going on down the road, that Moses is going to be one of the two witnesses. I, I wish Jude would expound it on that, right? That would have been pretty awesome just to give us more information, but he doesn't. Um, and so we don't really know, but we, all we know is that, yeah, God buried him. And so the children of Israel, you know, they had this period of mourning for Moses for 30 days. They went into this intense psychotherapy sessions to get their minds straight. No, they didn't do that. They just moved on. You know, it's kind of interesting. When their mourning ended, they moved on. I think that's really important. I, I remember when my, my dad died, and man, it's been many years, and my mom went to the doctor, and the doctor said, do you want to be put on some antidepressants? I'm so thankful my mom did not, because she didn't need them. She said, why do you want to prolong what I'm going to have to go through? I'm mourning the death of my husband. I have to go through that. And she did, and she's done amazing, you know? Yeah, it, there is a time of mourning for our loved ones when they die. But then we have to move on. And if we don't, it can paralyze us. Children of Israel, they're going to move on. Is it always easy? No, it's not. I mean, think about it. They were with some of these people. The only leader they knew was Moses their entire life. Moses. He's gone, now we have Joshua. We don't know this guy as much. But they'll find out. Now, verse 9. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. So Joshua's in charge. Um, God put his spirit upon him to lead the, lead the people forward. And they followed him. They saw that the leadership of Moses was passed on to Joshua, and they're following Joshua for one reason. Joshua was following the Lord, and that's the key. Well, verse 10, But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, and all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land, and by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of Israel. Yeah, he was a great servant of God. And what made him a great servant of God was his faith. It wasn't a perfect faith. He struggled. He had some difficult times, but his faith in, in God. In fact, we'll see in, in Hebrews 11, verses 23 through 29, Moses is spoken of in this great section called the Hall of Faith. And so were his parents who built this love for God into this man. Moses, even though he was full of so much weakness, he was also the man of God, the servant of the Lord. So as we close these first five books of Moses, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, we go to the book of Joshua. Joshua, actually, well, it's pretty close to when I started um, teaching Joshua 29 years ago. That was the first book I taught here. The first message I gave here was Acts 2.42, where they continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, Breaking of Bread Fellowship, and so on. But the first book I taught, Joe Minch finished up in Deuteronomy, and then I took over in the book of Joshua. And Joshua is an amazing book. There are so many lessons in there for us. Um, it's, it's living that spirit-filled life. You know, people think about the promised land as heaven. Well, 
read the book of Joshua. Joshua is bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. What do they have to do? There's all kinds of battles. When I go to heaven, there's no battles. Those are over, right? Praise God for that. The only battle in heaven is when Michael is fighting against the demonic forces and kicks him out of heaven in the, uh, during um, the three-and-a-half-year mark of the seven-year tribulation period. That's the only battle, and we're not part of it. So the promised land is a spirit-filled life, walking in the spirit, trusting in God. Is it easy? No, man, some of the battles are intense. And sometimes what God calls us to do seems foolish but he calls us to do it and it's amazing what he can do i'll share this with you and i'll close i promise i will close with this sometimes the foolishness of god it seems ridiculous i, I pastor mike mcintosh um, told the story about a young man who went to his church. He was a young Christian, very new in the Lord. He was driving through a very wealthy California neighborhood, and uh, he heard God speak to him and say, pull over, get out of the car, put your head in the mailbox, and yell at the top of your lungs, Jesus loves you. It's like, what? And he kept hearing that, and he's like, Get behind me, Satan. He goes, this can't be of God. This is the most ridiculous thing in the world. I, I can't do it. And yet the Lord kept impressing upon him, pull over, stop your car, get out, put your head in a mailbox, and yell, Jesus loves you. It's like, ah, I got to do it. I can't, I got to do it. So he's, he pulls over and he finds his big mailbox gets out of his car, he's looking around to see if anyone's there, no one's there, sticks his head in his mailbox and yells at the top of his lungs, Jesus loves you. And then he's getting back to go into his car because he's terrified that someone saw him and you know, is going to be yelling at him. And as soon as he gets in his car, here comes this guy running out of his house. It's like, oh no, now I'm in for it. And the guy goes, what did you say? I said, Jesus loves you. He said, I was standing on a chair with a rope around my neck, and I said, Lord, if you don't show me you're real, I'm going to kill myself. And when I finish saying that, I hear this screaming voice, Jesus loves you. Wow. Please don't do that here in Manitowoc. But God, unless God tells you, of course. But that's, I mean, when we read the story of Jericho, it's that crazy. But God told them, and they were obedient, and God gave them a tremendous victory. We'll see that as we get to the book of Joshua. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the book of Deuteronomy, Lord. Going over the history and some insight into things that, some of the other books didn't cover. And just lessons for us, Lord, which are so important. We thank you, Lord. And we just help us to grow. Help us to uh, learn to walk by faith, to trust in you, and to be your servant, to serve you all the days of our lives. Teach us the number of our days. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.